The UN says climate change is a threat to world peace. Now its Security Council is proposing a new environmental peacekeeping force to step into conflicts caused by shrinking resources. Are we looking at a new role for the UN? And what should be done to eliminate the root causes of global warming before dealing with the security consequences? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Jane Dutton. The United Nations Security Council has again linked climate change to global peace and security. It is now considering whether to expand its mandate to keep the peace in an era of climate change. Not all countries are on board to turn the UN's blue helmets green. Mohamed Shakir has this report. Concerns over global warming is being pushed to the top of the international agenda. The United Nations Security Council has just completed its first meeting focusing on how climate change threatens world peace. The United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has called on world leaders to take the issue seriously and face the responsibilities. Climate change is real. It is accelerating in a dangerous manner. And it not only exacerbates threat to international peace and security, it is a threat to international peace and security. Extreme weather events continue to grow more frequent and intense in rich and poor countries alike, not only devastating lives, but also infrastructure, institutions, and budgets, an unholy brew which can create dangerous security vacuums. The UN's sudden urgency comes as a response to a number of climate-related disasters. An ongoing famine in Somalia is threatening the lives of thousands and creating as many as a million refugees. A blistering heat wave across much of the central United States has already been blamed for the death of more than 20 people. And the cyclone in Mexico has forced the closure of major courts and businesses. The United Nations is hoping world leaders take these natural disasters seriously when they meet for a climate conference in South Africa in December. We are now talking about a one meter sea level rise possibly occurring this century. Mr. President, if you look at the world map and you realize how many tens of thousands of kilometers of coastline will be affected by this, how in a sense we will redraw the world's map, not only in geographical terms, but also in terms of uh, exclusive economic zones and many other implications, you begin to realize that we are truly confronted with a level of scientific knowledge now that is sufficient for us to begin to realize that we are talking about major implications. But not all countries are showing the same level of concern. Russia objected to having the issue of climate change brought before the Security Council, the United Nations' most powerful body. It led to a clash between Russian diplomats and Western representatives. Moscow initially blocked the adoption of a statement by the United Nations before agreeing to a revised, weaker version that would only acknowledge possible security implications. We have dozens of countries in this body and in this very room whose very existence is threatened. They've asked this council to demonstrate our understanding that their security is profoundly threatened. Instead, because of the refusal of a few to accept our responsibility, this council is saying by its silence, in effect, tough luck. This is more than disappointing. It's pathetic. It's short-sighted. And frankly, it's a dereliction of duty. Global acceptance of the science may lead to moving the debate to a new level, one where the discussion is focused on how to deal with the climate change and its security implications before it's too late. Mohamed Chukir for Inside Story. Right, let's get straight into this, talk to our guests, all of them joining us from London. Sabrina Chesterman, a climate change consultant based in Cape Town in South Africa. Tobias Seekin, a senior research fellow at the Climate Change and Security Programme for RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute. And Cleo Pascal, associate fellow for the Energy, Environment and Development Programme at Chatham House. Ms. Pascal, should the UN take the plunge into green peacekeeping? I think that it would be much better if uh, more 
in-depth analysis was done about what's actually causing the problem in the first place. My concern is that this actually isn't the first time the UN Security Council has debated climate change as a security issue. It happened four years ago when the UK had the chair in the lead up to the Copenhagen climate talks. And the link has been made very clearly through the way that it was approached between climate change and energy usage and carbon reduction. And the line is very much, we have a security problem, so we need to cut carbon. If it, the debate was broadened out to we have a security problem caused by environmental changes that have to do with other things like depleting aquifers, population growth, urbanization, then I think we'd be in a much better position to find solutions that will actually help in what is becoming an increasingly dangerous security environment globally. Mr. Seekin, what do you think of that? Um, I, I, I mean, to a degree, I, I, I would agree. Okay, so this is the second time now that the UN Security Council has debated climate change as a security issue. I guess my biggest concern in terms of the debate that occurred yesterday, um, that you didn't really see too much progression from where we were four years ago. Um, I think what it demonstrates is there's a continued necessity for a more highly granulated understanding of exactly you know, how different factors, economic, social, political factors intertwine with uh, the added impact of climate change and really understand how this is going to impact future scenarios. And I, I mean, in, in terms of the idea of a, a, a green UN force, if you like, I think that's going to be very, very difficult, a very difficult idea to, to sell, um, especially in a time when, uh, you know, countries are, are somewhat reticent to deliver troops for peacekeeping missions. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if that's a bit of a, a misnomer on the, on the UN's part, but I'm not sure how serious they're going to drive down that path. I mean, it's not unusual for military forces to protect areas of uh, environmental significance, um, but, I, but I think that might be a bit of a, a black hole that the UN might be wandering down if they pursue that too heavily. Do you agree, Ms. Chesterman? Do you think this is possibly a black hole? Is this something that the UN is going to take seriously? I, I agree. I think um, this is my, my worry with this coming onto the agenda again, uh, and, and like the other two have, have stated, that this is it's not really what came out of yesterday's debate is, is nothing really new, and it shows again this the same issue of an, an entrenching within a UN body. Uh, you look at the Euro UN Security Council, the amount of issues and the mandate they have to cover is huge, and, and the complexities of climate change and, and the issues that go into it, I mean, it's it's worrying thinking, are they going to be able to, to cover this? And, and I would agree that talking about a green keep peacekeeping force is, is, is slightly moving away from actually let's think about the root causes and let's think about how complex like now and in So East should you Africa deal with the, the root causes saying, first, the consequences later? Yeah, I think I think by patching over, we're, we're not thinking actually what is the root cause of this, what are these, let's think right to the bottom of the scale of the problem and saying, okay, where upon this scale does conflict come in, where are the risks? I mean, one of the biggest problems is with climate change is still this definition of vulnerability, saying which areas are most vulnerable, how are we defining this? And this kind of lies at the key of a lot of the debates between, you know, in the UNFCCC negotiation process to say who's, who's causable, who's attributable, and how, how do we then disperse um, any form of negotiation? and agreement, how do we um, disperse out of that? So I really think um, focusing on this kind of uh, conflict resolution and, and the, the green force is really moving away from actually let's think about the root cause and let's get, let's get talking on that. Ms. Pascal, the US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton apparently said in a talk about climate change, never waste a good crisis. Do you think this is what she's referring to? Politicians say a lot of things. Um, if, uh, if this is really acknowledged to be a crisis, uh, and I'm not sure it is domestically in the U.S., um, then yes, definitely let's, let's use it. But if we're using the, the actual crisis of a changing physical environment undermining our domestic security and international security to accomplish a different goal, which would be, for example, to put in place carbon trading mechanisms, then you, you've used the crisis, but not to solve the actual root causes of the problem. I mean, I'd prefer to see instead of, you know, uh, green peacekeepers, you know, green helmeted engineers and city planners and the, the sort of people that can help engineer our way out of the actual physical causes of the problem. 
um, in a much more rounded fashion. When Katrina hit New Orleans, it was a Category 3 hurricane in a hurricane zone. That city was destroyed because it was subsiding, it was built on floodplains, the water courses had been redesigned. We engineered that disaster. Without climate change, that disaster still would have been there. So if we're concerned about environmental change undermining our infrastructure, which it definitely is, then we need to look beyond just climate change. And even within climate change, we need to look beyond just carbon to find rounded solutions. And if the UN has its way, if we could go back to Katrina, we would have seen a whole lot of peacekeeping forces in the US. How do you think that would have gone down? It wouldn't have been possible. I mean, it simply wouldn't have been possible. And domestically, the U.S. has a very serious problem because it has, according to the latest national intelligence sort of estimates, at least 30 U.S. bases at risk of sea level rise. And those bases will not be moved because no congressman wants a base to leave their area. It's a high income generator, high employment area. And this gets to how complex the problem is. This isn't just a physical problem. This is uh, our, our environment has been knitted into our economic legal and political systems in such a way so that, you know, when it changes and the other systems don't change, we have real fragility and instability in the problems. The, one of the biggest problems during Katrina was Keesler Air Force Base was destroyed. It cost a billion dollars to rebuild, but they rebuilt it in the same location, leaving it vulnerable to the next hurricane that comes through. We haven't really incorporated the security elements into our decision making yet. I think I think Cleo actually picks up on a, a really important point there, and it's you know uh, it's that that decisions and, and and policy decisions need to start taking into consideration the impacts of climate and environmental factors. Um, I guess it just means using a bit of foresight and taking those kind of no risk policy or low risk policy decisions, um, which which mean that you know rebuilding a military base in an at-risk area is probably not a very clever thing to do. Think about you know what the future climate might look like uh, the environmental factors in that particular region um, and, and, and then take that into consideration when you're planning to rebuild any kind of settlement, be it military or otherwise. I think in terms of returning to the UN security debate, I think it is useful insofar that it's, you know, it's, it's introducing at that top global level kind of new security agendas. Now we've seen a raft of national security policies coming out of the UK, the US and, and globally, uh, including the EU. Um, which are all beginning to look at broader concepts of security. Now, uh, the UN Security Council could be accused of perhaps uh, having quite a narrow definition, you know, stuck, if you like, in that Cold War mold of thinking about, uh, you know, large state interventions and, and uh, conflicts. Um, and, and I don't think it does any harm to be talking about these kinds of issues because the new security environment is far more complex than it was when the UN was conceived all those years ago. Um, so it's important that they do take on these kinds of debates you know, the same kind of furore was caused uh, within when the UN Security Council held a debate about uh, HIV and AIDS. Um, you know, the, the, the procedural queries about it appearing on the agenda uh, were prominent then also. Um, but I think it's important that the UN Security Ta Council tackles these issues, but that it, it does it in a way which is constructive uh, to action. And I, I, I'm still, to return to the UN green, green hats, if you like, I'm not quite sure that's the constructive process. I think the, the elements that, that clear was talking about um, are, the, are the more productive outcomes. You know, how can we begin addressing this in policy? How can we, you know, uh, make our infrastructure, our, our populations more resilient to the impacts of environmental disaster and climate change? Because there's a, a bit of a worry raised by natural news, and I'm going to put this to you, Ms. Chesterman. And I'm quoting from them. It says, you know, green is good for us. You can paint the tips of bullets green so that when they start firing into crowds of innocent protesters, they can claim it's not an act of war, but rather green kinetic action, good for the environment. Is that a worry? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, again, I would, I would be saying, you know, the problem with focusing on this sort of green being peacekeeping force again just re-entrenches this kind of very negative energy surrounding climate change saying it's this catastrophe and it's this problem and it's so overwhelming that how do we actually start dealing with it and I mean 
I would say coming from an African perspective, what I've seen on the ground is that really the focus needs to go right back down to really simple solutions to say, let's not talk about a very kind of stance of conflict and saying and, and entrenching it in this negative view to say it needs to start with really small simple solutions on the ground working with people who are right at the scale of vulnerability to say these are the people that need to enact change for themselves and they need to learn how to adapt and and to mitigate as well in in whichever way is possible and I think the problem is framing it around the conflict and the security debate um, and my worry with this is to say to keep entrenching it in this very negative energy to say it's it's such a calamitous problem and it's such a standoff between these you know 193 countries that come together every year to discuss this that um, actually we're going to get nowhere and I mean as the negotiations are going we're predicting temperature increases of you know up to three to four degrees in some places and I mean we're still set, set in a negotiations phase it's talking about two degrees so you know Let there's this two tendency of a sort of jumping in. Ms. Chesterman I know you know a lot about Somalia and the root causes of the problems there. Do you think more could have been done to prevent this kind of response by the UN? Well, I think, I mean, just going back to the Somalian and the East African issue, I mean, th that's an issue that's been there for 20 years. I mean, it's come up now because a, a basically a climate shock, a consecutive drought has caused huge food security issues. I mean, these are people who really live on the edge of vulnerability and they rain fails, crops fail, and they have no food. I mean, it's a really simple solution. And I mean, basically, people are living in an area they can't feed themselves. And, and, and this is an entrenched uh, problem across many of those regions. And you're looking at regions that over the last 5, 10, 15 years have, have changed dramatically in their, their climatic conditions. And so you're looking at also in an area where there's, where there's high conflict, there's, there's civil war, there's, there's no governance, there's, there's issues that are peripheral to the climate things, but when there's an, a climate shock like this, it really does leave a whole uh, range of population that live in a very uh, tenuous existence already into, into a, a disaster. Um, and so I think that, that, that it needs to go back to reframing to say, how can we work with these existing populations to build their capacity as quickly as possible and to put people in a position where they can, they can help themselves and reduce their level of vulnerability because I mean, make people it are getting more sustainable these... as well, isn't it? Uh, let me put that to Ms. Exactly. Pascal. I mean, uh, Somalia is a, a perfect example of, of people who are struggling. They, they're struggling with the environment. They're struggling with security issues. Just shows how these two issues really do run hand in hand, don't they? And of course, the, the knock-on effect from Somalia on Kenya, for example, we have no idea what that's going to be. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, these issues are extremely global and extremely interconnected. So, for example, um, Russia had uh, forest fires that affected its wheat crop and a drought that affected its wheat crop last summer. As a result, they stopped all export of wheat. One of their biggest customers for wheat was Egypt. Also, when they stopped the exports, that gave uh, the global commodities market an excuse to uh, speculate around wheat prices, and wheat prices went up about 80%. In Egypt, they went up around 30%, and it was a factor in the Arab Spring that we saw happening on the streets of Egypt. You know, the, the fundamental cost of food had gone up so much, it, cre it, it contributed to what was going on politically and other factors as well. That created what happened in Egypt, and potentially has now weakened Egypt's position because it's going through a transition period in relation to the very delicate negotiations going on along the whole Nile River basin. Uh, China has been building dams in Sudan. That has not been popular with other countries that are also relying in the region on those river systems. But with Egypt's relatively weakening position along the Nile system as it goes through its transition, there is uh, more opportunity for other players to come in and gain advantage in the region. So you have a situation where forest fires in Russia one summer catapult and, and, and move into all of these other areas. So if you're sending in sort of green peacekeepers, to a problem in Sudan, um, is that because of what happened in Russia environmentally, or is that because of what's happening just regionally? Is that because of speculation on the market? Is that because, you know, these are extremely interrelated factors. So uh, we do need to deal with the crises on the ground, but if we're gonna start looking at some root problems and some root issues that need to be addressed, we need to cast our net very wide indeed. Which nations are most responsible for climate change? Topping the list is China, accounting for almost 26% 
of CO2 emissions. The U.S. is responsible for almost 20 percent, while India and Russia account for just over 5 percent. More than 3 percent comes from Japan. China and the U.S. also remain the top two for greenhouse gas emissions. Brazil accounts for almost 7 percent. Indonesia follows close behind, emitting almost 5 percent of the world's greenhouse gases. Uh, Mr. Seekin, if that is the case, how many peacekeepers then should be drafted from the big four? Um, I, th I think, if I'm honest, I think we should draw ourselves away from the discussion about UN peacekeeping forces. I think it's a misnomer. I don't think it will happen. And I don't think it's particularly helpful for framing this discussion. Um, I think, you know, the big issue at the UN when you talk about those countries and the emitters um, and some of the complaints that there have been from the developing nations is the fact that they feel that perhaps the countries who are driving this debate are the Western countries who they see as primarily responsible. And they see that it's drawing attention away from the UN. And FCCC process um, and from the General Assembly itself. So and is I think, this you know, passing the buck, do you think? Uh, fact is it passing the buck? Um, no, I, I, not necessarily. It's a, it's a genuine grievance at the international level. Um, so, you know, it's something that has to be addressed. And, and to an extent, the Security Council, uh, Western me, countries are beginning to. Can't the Security Council take tougher action? I mean, can they say, right, uh, You've made all these promises at all these conferences. Nothing ever happens. You've promised to reduce your emissions. You haven't done that. If you don't do it this time, we're going to impose some sort of draconian measures on you. Uh, I think that becomes a very, very dangerous position to take if, if they were going to begin to imposing whatever draconian measures you might propose um, upon those kinds of nations. Um, I think we've seen in the past that the UN struggles to, to really impose very, very strict um, measures like you might be uh, suggesting. Um, but it, it, again, I don't think we will get to that position because there are countries who are complaining about this issue being on the Security Council table and primarily, you know, the Russias and, and Chinas of this world. Unfortunately, they, you know, they don't they don't like this issue being discussed at the Security Council level for exactly this reason, because it becomes hugely complex um, because of the number of different issues you have to think about, because there are no clear cut security responses that you can make aside from uh, planning more efficient and effective emergency response and disaster response. Uh, you know that. Those are the kinds of measures you can take. But, but in terms of the UN taking kind of unilateral action um, with green peacekeepers uh, against people who don't perhaps adhere to, to um, treaties, if that's what you're getting at, I, I think it's very improbable that we'll get to that position and, and quite dangerous if we did. Do you agree with that, Ms. Pascal? I see you nodding away there. Well, it's, sort of, it's an interesting question because um, uh, I think we should be shifting towards more renewable energy sources and towards greater efficiencies for straight up energy security reasons. No question. Uh, I think that pinning all of the blame for climate change uh, strictly on energy related fossil fuel emissions, which is the way it's been going now, is a very incomplete way of looking at the problem. So if you look at Russia, for example, um, Yes, fossil fuel emissions is a big problem. Bigger problem coming out of Russia is release of methane, which is also a greenhouse gas from the thawing permafrost. Methane is, you know, 26 times more potent greenhouse gas uh, than carbon, and it's it it is extremely destructive. We saw with the uh, with the global financial crisis, we had a, a periodic deindustrialization globally, which is essentially kind of what you'd want to see with the kind of carbon regime that you're looking at in terms of reduction of emissions. It did not have a noticeable effect on uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. That shows that it's not completely a complete solution. I still think we need to shift away for, as I said, for energy security reasons alone, it's a pretty good idea, but it's not going to solve this problem. If greenhouse gases are the only problem, carbon is not the only greenhouse gas we need to be looking at. Okay, Ms. Chesterman, what do you think the shift should be? Because the reality is it's going to get worse. Are I mean, we looking at 200 million people being displaced by 2050 because of environmental concerns? Yeah, I mean, I, I would completely agree with the point, just to, to go back to the point earlier, that focusing on this issue of debating attribution and saying who's responsible, I think, is is really diverging from saying, let's really get right back to the table and say, right, we need solutions now. This 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 giant chemistry experiment that's happening now with climate change is happening now. And it's, it's, it's literally impossible to say 
this country with this emission is due to uh, sea level rise in another area and I mean even look at the cases now against the you know Chevron and 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 small island states saying is there a legal case that we can actually you know uh, pin pin something on some specific entity or company or or country I mean that I think that really starts taking the debate about where where it needs to go from and I think solutions are needed and they're needed urgently and and I would argue that um, from from a grassroots level it's really looking at saying um, looking at shared resources we going to have to leave it there and hopefully the, all these words get turned into action by the environmentalists. Sabrina Chesterman, <laughs> the last person talking there, Tobias Seekin and Claire Pascal all talking to us from London. Thank you. And of course, thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Goodbye and thanks for watching.